Hello and welcome to White Swan, the podcast that gives you the inside story on how leaders tackle crises. I'm Gavin McGaw, and on this podcast, we aim to furnish you with the learnings behind the headlines so that when the proverbial hits the fan, you can keep things turning. On this episode of White Swan, we're going to be joined by James Bealby, Chief Executive of FWD, the Trade Association for Food and Drink Wholesalers in the UK. During our chats, we uh, speak about his career and the crises he has faced. We also explore the supply chain pressures we're presently seeing across the globe and the perpetual crisis that organisations now seem to be stuck in. But before that, let's hear from Karen White of National in Canada and Gary Cleland of Hanover in the UK. Welcome, Karen and Gary. Hey, Gav. Hey, Gav. Now, the chat with James was timely, especially on the perfect storm that businesses are facing with rising COVID cases, supply chain pressures, labour market issues and Brexit. Yet he was very clear about the problems and what he and his team needed to do. Karen, James seemed to be great at simplifying complicated issues to what people needed to hear and what people could understand. That's incredibly difficult to do, but incredibly important in crisis situations, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of what James said really resonated for me. Um, You know, I am the board chair of the Maritimes Energy Association, and we're often the voice of industry and have to tackle some really challenging issues. And at the heart of that, effective advocacy and communications, it's so important to influencing public policy, um, the development and increasing public awareness about important sector issues, and really making sure that we are delivering a clear and simplified message that people can understand and rally around. It's so important to influencing public perception. You know, hydraulic fracturing, for example, it's not the simplest thing to explain. So having really simple, clear messages that people can understand, it's so important. And I think for industry association, that's one of the main benefits that we bring is that cover in terms of being forthright and clear in communications and a little bit more direct than perhaps proponents can. So I think understanding those issues that span your members, having your point of view and your positioning very clear, that's what brings value for your members. And that's what I think James does for his his uh, members as well. What's your take, Gary? Well, I think there's often a misperception that simplifying a complicated topic is in some way to dumb it down, uh, when in reality, that's not true at all. Uh, there's a nice expression that I read recently, which is that Big words are hiding places. Uh, And in a crisis, you don't want to be hiding. You want and need to be transparent. You want to be providing clarity uh, and reassurance. And you want to be answering questions rather than raising them. And when you don't have an answer, you need to be able to show the direction in which you're traveling and the process that's being followed. If you can't do that, then you're going to struggle to communicate your position and your point of view effectively. And that runs the obvious risk of creating misunderstanding or skepticism. And that can actually exacerbate the situation you're in. Yeah, I think there's some research that came out recently in regard to complicated language being used, for instance, in uh, earnings calls within the city and how it led to the brands and the organizations that were um, owning those calls having worse results in the following year. Um, so obviously, simple language, clear, concise, compelling language really does cut through. Right. Thanks for that, Gary. Uh, right. Let's hear what James had to say. Each episode of White Swan features an in-depth conversation with a senior figure from the world of business. So we get to learn about their crisis experiences and the lessons you need to hear. And we have got a great and timely guest with us today. James Bealby is the Chief Executive of FWD, also known as the Federation of Wholesale Distributors, which is a trade association for food and drink wholesalers in the UK. FWD's membership uh, distribute food and drink and associated products to nearly half a million retail and catering businesses in the UK. So if you eat out or buy food or drinks in shops in the UK, you will undoubtedly use James's members. James has held the post of chief exec since 2009 and was previously in publishing, including acting as editor of the convenience magazine, Retail Express. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Gavin, and thanks for inviting me on. Now, there couldn't be a more interesting time to talk to someone in your role, uh, given everything that's going on with supply chains in the news. But before we get into that, can you tell us how you ended up becoming chief executive at FWD? 
I sort of fell into it, to be honest. I know that doesn't sound like the sort of dynamic career path that you want to hear from business leaders, but uh, it was very much a sort of progression of what I've been doing previously, which you alluded to, which was journalism. I, I did an English degree, and then I my first job was to work, working at News International, uh, which no longer exists anymore. Uh, I was working in the library there, doing research across the four titles. And I, I really enjoyed that job, but I realised that actually I'd rather be on the other side of the fence um, and at that point, I decided to become a journalist. Um, I worked in local papers for a while and then pivoted to the trade press. And I was writing about the industry that I now represent. And I think it was similar to what happened to me when I worked at News International. I realized that I would rather be doing stuff than writing about people doing stuff. And an opportunity came up at FWD to work as their sort of communications person, really. Um, that was 2008, and eight, nine, something like that. I'd been working at New Trade for maybe four or five years and got to the point where I thought, well, you know, there's loads of interesting things going on. Being someone on the sidelines is not actually as much fun as doing it yourself. Um, and then the previous incumbent of this role, which was actually called the Director General in those days, it was rather old fashioned, a grandiose title. Uh, he retired and I stepped into his warm shoes. Um, that was 2009, 10, something like that. Yeah, and it's been downhill ever since, really. <laughs> so that means you've come in to the role sort of viewing the issues as a communications professional, an external mindset and, uh, approach to these things. Do you think that's held you in good stead as you entered the organization and then had to start dealing with issues and crises as they came up? I think so. I think it's really useful to be able to encapsulate difficult issues in a simple, easy to understand format. And that really does help when communicating these crises. Often people will be, uh, you know, taking what are difficult issues and making them seem even more complicated. Whereas I think boiling them down to a simple message is a good way of communicating what's actually happening. So, yes, it stood me in good stead. It's good experience. And I think there's sort of two routes, really, for the trade association professional. One is people like myself or 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 uh, trade association professionals who've worked in trade associations all of their life. The other are people who have done the role within the um, business that you're representing. So they've been a senior executive in um, food and drink, say, and then they go and work in the uh, food and drink industry trade association. And I think they have uh, a lot to offer because they know the industry inside out. But I think the communications people have as much to offer because they understand the issues and they're used to uh, communicating those outwards in a simple to understand format so they're two different approaches i think both are good but they, they do complement each other i mean industry knowledge and expertise is obviously the most important thing you can have you need to know your members inside out and understand their issues totally in order to be able to represent them so i think having worked in that industry helps but having written about it is equally as helpful yeah, it gives you a lot of credibility, I guess. And you have a huge membership. I mean, from some big, some small. How difficult is it managing a membership of that type? And also the reality being that in a membership organization, one person uh, acting in a poor way can have a reputational impact on the others. How do you manage that and manage the egos uh, with big organizations and small organizations leaders? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, we do have a disparate, uh, organization in terms of members so we've got about 600 wholesalers 150 suppliers and service providers um, and within those wholesalers you'll have businesses which are turning over billions of pounds and businesses which are turning over you know maybe a million two million three million very very different size and scale of businesses very different challenges um, it is hard sometimes I think you need to think about what are the common denominators so when we're talking to government we think and we talk about the issues which are unique to us as wholesalers. So if we're talking about cost pressures, we're talking about not general cost pressures like uh, living wage or whatever it might be, but about how that impacts on our sector. And that is common across all of our membership. But I think you're right when you say that, you know, there's a long tail. And sometimes that can be a challenge if you've got uh, members who are perhaps, um, you know, not as professional as, 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 as the bigger organisations, or they're people that we don't really know, and don't communicate with particularly effectively, which is 
you know, something that we try and get better at, but it's hard to reach these people sometimes. You don't necessarily know what their challenges are, so it's hard to represent them. And that, that can be difficult, but I think you need to just focus on what are the common factors between all and things like the um, supply of food and drink is something that they all do um, to different uh, extents. What are the common factors within that? What are the challenges they face both internally and externally and focus on those? Yeah, so find the areas of commonality rather than the difference. And look, when you first came into the role, you, of course, like all leaders, face issues. Um, uh, what was the first issue or crisis you dealt with that you can remember uh, in your career at FWD? Yeah, well, when I came in in the uh, 2009-10, the big issue that we faced into at the time was duty fraud on alcohol. So it was very much a wild west for the sale of alcohol. There was no regulation for anybody selling wholesale volumes of, of alcohol. Um, and lots of uh, operators in the marketplace were selling product which didn't have the tax paid on it, duty fraud, as the name suggests, uh, via a number of different routes. And that was having a major impact on legitimate wholesalers because they were unable to compete on the basis of, of price uh, because wholesalers who were supposedly legitimate were selling products which were tax-free and therefore cheaper. They were losing sales. The legitimate operators were losing sales sales to those uh, wholesalers who were selling ex-duty products. Um, and that was causing major pain for the market. If you think about our members, their turnover is something in the region of 30 billion, give or take. Um, 30% of that, so 10 billion, would be in alcohol. So if your sales have gone down by as much as 40%, that's going to have a major impact. And that was something that had been going on for uh, you know seven or eight years. It wasn't a new problem, but we'd never actually been able to crack it other than talking to HMRC and making them aware of the issue. So we very much grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and made that into a campaign to say, right, what is the outcome here that we need? And what we wanted was regulation for our market. It was a rare situation of a trade association calling for its members to be more regulated uh, in order to exclude those operators from the market who were selling product which was non-duty paid. Um, that then led to, I think, about three years of campaigning, hard campaigning. We started uh, bombing um, the uh, par bombing parliament with parliamentary questions. We got the Public Accounts Committee to do an inquiry into HMRC failures. That led to a number of select committees. And I think HMRC were pretty exasperated, to be honest, by the fact that we were really holding their feet to the fire and saying, look, you're not doing anything about this problem. You're losing billions of pounds of tax revenue every year. Why aren't you doing anything? And we then devised a scheme called the Alcohol Wholesaler Registration Scheme, which meant that anyone buying or selling alcohol in wholesale quantities, business to business, had to be registered for HMRC. That came in in 2017, so that's seven or eight years after we first started campaigning for it. And it made an immediate impact. Sales of alcohol for our members went up hugely overnight, rose by 20% in year one. Um, and that's been maintained. So it was something which had been happening for a number of years and people had sort of thought, well, there's not much we can do about that. We've just got to suck it up. My view was, no, there is something we can do about it. We need to put the hard yards in. It's going to involve a lot of shoe leather. It's going to involve a lot of legwork, but we can actually crack this. We just need to keep the relentless pressure up. And it wasn't easy, but we got there in the end. Um, and once we'd done that, we're then thinking, right, what next? Uh, and, and and by the way, we were still working on all the day-to-day -day issues that were coming up alongside this. It wasn't just our sole uh, campaign. All the other public affairs issues that we were facing into every every day, we were still working on. It was just an overarching thing that we would talk about. And we actually took some advice from um, someone, I can't remember who it was now, but somebody who worked in PR, and they said that the point at which you are utterly sick to the back teeth about talking about something is the point at which one person may have heard it, which was sort of quite, made quite a lot of sense really. Cause we got, you know, we were thinking we can't keep banging on about this. We're so bored of it now. We're just the same messages. And they were saying, no, that's, that's the point at which you break through. And that was probably after about two years, to be honest. Interesting. And uh, you didn't have uh, long to wait till another crisis came into play with horse meat in 2013, did you? Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, the horse meat scandal. I remember it well because it was the first time that we or that I had been called in to uh, meet a cabinet 
uh, secretary, um, Owen Patterson, actually, in the news at the moment, uh, was the secretary of state for DEFRA at the time. We were called into his office on a Saturday morning. And as we walked along to Nobel House, where DEFRA were based, um, there were lots of paparazzi there and reporters. And if you go on to uh, some of the uh, agency picture sites, you'll see a photo of me looking very worried and harassed as I walked in on Saturday morning to this meeting. But yeah, it was a, it was a, an immediate crisis. And actually, again, that was a question of grip because there was um, horse meat had been discovered in in the meat supply. Um, how it got there probably by uh, malicious contam- contamination and it was something that as uh, uh, representing an industry which sold a lot of meat we had to face into um and that was i think the first time that we or first time that i stepped up to become the person being interviewed as opposed to the person doing the interviewing and i was on uh media a lot which, I, which was a newish experience i mean i've done bits and pieces of tv before i think i'd done some stuff around extreme weather when there was a load of snow and the, the roads were closed, but not really to the extent that it was the full media round. And I hadn't actually had any training or guidance on that at all. I was interviewed by Nikki Campbell on uh, Radio 5 Live, half seven. I think it was on the Tuesday after it broke on the Friday or Saturday. And uh, he said to me, oh, were you shocked when you heard about this? And I sort of floundered a bit and said, oh, I'm not really sure that my sort of uh, my, my my personal view is of any significance here. And he was then saying, what, you were complacent, you didn't care. Well, why why, didn't you, why weren't you shocked? Why weren't you surprised? And I didn't really know how to deal with this. And then just by pure coincidence, I went to a meeting with Jack Straw, uh, who was a backbench MP by then. He had been Home Secretary and Foreign Secretary in the, in the Blair government. And uh, I was telling him about this. And he was saying, well, I'm somebody who's done a lot of half seven in the morning interviews. What you should have done was said, yes, it's appalling. I'm utterly shocked. And this is what we're doing to uh, to address it. And I was getting media training in real time. Unfortunately, it came like two hours late, but it was brilliant. And I was thinking, this is it. I, I finally arrived now. I mean, I'm in the thick of the in the thick of it, so to speak. I'm the center of power. But the horse meat thing was an example of a, a breaking crisis, but it was one that we were able to deal with. And we put in place a lot of tests. And we were su- supplying data to the Food Standards Agency to demonstrate that the products that we were selling were in the clear. And it was very much a storm in a teacup, really. It led to a number of structural changes post that. But at the time, it was, yeah, really, really in the eye of the storm. And amazing, actually, when you think about it. It seems quite a sort of, um, almost a sort of genteel, naive time, really. The fact that that was the biggest story of the day. And it was a you know, blanket coverage on something horse meat being found in in minced beef i mean to be honest the things that we face into now that would be like you know down page on page seven but it's interesting isn't it because it really was leading the headlines it was uh, top item of every news bulletin it was front page of every newspaper for at least a week and i think it also shows the human connection to what we eat people get passionate about this people care about it so for you taking an organization that had done campaigning on issues in the past but you know, this was a real proper crisis, wasn't it? In terms of, I'm guessing you're having to respond on behalf of the industry, plus also help me a government happy with the direction of travel uh, and try and downplay the reality of the problem. That's tough from a management perspective, isn't it? When a crisis hits like that. It is tough. It is tough. And one of the things that we had to do was get information from our members. Again, not something we particularly had to do in real time previously. You know, we were surveying them about issues all the time, but not to the extent where we need this information by 3 p.m. today, you know, clear the decks to get on with it. But to be honest, members wanted to do that anyway because they didn't want to suffer reputational damage, which a lot of them would have been had they been discovered to have had horse meat in their their offer. So, yeah, it was. It was a real baptism of fire, and it was unlike anything else we'd ever faced into because previously we were the ones trying to drive the agenda. At this point, it was being imposed on us. So... As crisis management goes, it was great. It was straight into the fire, uh, you know, into the frying pan, so to speak. And it was a really, really good experience because it, we came out the other side much fitter and leaner, which was good. Had we not done so, perhaps it wouldn't have been such a good experience. But it was having to think on, on your feet and then come up with solutions in real time was really, really good experience and something that we continued to learn from, really. I mean, we didn't get any advice or help on any of it. We were making it up as we went along, like lots of these things, to be honest. But 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 that's often great in terms of innovation within an industry and an organization to sort of learn new things. One of the things that struck me about that crisis was the response from the individual 
um, producers out there wasn't always great and they needed someone to fall back on, i.e. yourselves and other organizations. But the, often that problem was because they were not set up to talk about themselves as B2B suppliers. They just di didn't see their reputation externally as being a key factor. Do you think that's a key learning from this? That everyone realizes they need to have some type of public face because if you're supplying big supermarkets, they want you to have a public face in some way because they won't want to answer the questions on your behalf. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, we can act as a human shield in many ways. That's the, one of the roles of trade associations to say things that others don't want to say publicly. We can go further and faster than they can because we don't have any customers other than our members. We don't have any reputational damage. You need to be a little bit careful because obviously we're the voice of the industry. We don't want to be too outrageous and too outlandish. That can then be counterproductive and you go the other way. But yeah, it, it, it's happened frequently over my career in the trade association world that businesses will ask you to say things that they don't want to say themselves publicly and that's fine that's what we're there to do i think you know the the more controversial or the more um sort of radical you can be in your statements and your solutions the more airtime you'll get i'll give you an example from or recent times uh with the shortage of hgv drivers we knew that there was this was brewing back in May, even before then, but it became obvious that in May there was a real problem. And we spoke to the uh, our good friends, the Daily Mail, uh, often the first port of call for these types of things, and said to them, look, the government need to get the army on standby. There's not enough HGV drivers to supply food and drink. That's going to mean schools, hospitals, care homes, prisons are going to be disadvantaged. Get the army ready. They ran that as the story. That became the story then. Had we said there's a shortage of HGV drivers and it means that some of the drops to convenience stores aren't going to get there in time, they'll be a bit late, no one would have cared. But by immediately going straight in to say, oh, get the army ready, there's a crisis brewing, we've got the headlines. And incidentally, the army did then deliver fuel uh, you know, a month or so ago when there was a fuel crisis. So we weren't crying wolf as we were accused of, of doing by uh baroness via the transport minister we were actually saying this is a genuine problem we need to go to the max which they eventually did do but that's how as a trade association you can say those types of things if a business operator had said we can't deliver to schools we can't deliver to hospitals we need the army to help us out that business would have gone bust but a trade association being able to say that you, you you've got cover to be able to be a bit more radical and a bit more outrageous in your statements to get airtime for issues which are perhaps not as bad as you paint them. Well, let's get into that, actually, That's because this is the perfect storm that the whole country in the UK is facing. And across the globe, everyone is seeing, we've seen billions of pounds of goods sat offshore in California at the minute. We're seeing supply and demand issues in terms of the employment market uh, and then lost products that relate to that. We're seeing climate change impacting logistics, transportation costs out of control, uh, and the pandemic and the additional bureaucracy on a global basis really causing issues. And that's not even mentioning Brexit. So for you guys, your membership must be tearing their hair out with everything that's going on at the minute. What, what, and you know, help our listeners explain why this is happening. Yeah, I think the, I think somebody possibly might have even been the government described it as an effing crisis. So, you know, energy, food, fuel, all uh, at premium, all getting more expensive. Um, it's, it, it's very much the perfect storm. I'm never quite sure what that phrase means exactly, but it does sort of people know what you mean when you say it. The whole range of different factors that are all coming together at once. Um, some of them related to the pandemic and the the uh, sort of hangover from that and the the, the continuation of of the pandemic but yeah there's a shortage of labor not just hgv drivers there's 500,000 vacancies in the food and drink supply chain that's 13 percent of the total workforce there's 100,000 hgv drivers that are required um labor market uh is so tight that that's meaning there's a lot of wage inflation but it's also having a knock-on impact on the supply chain so what we've learned i think in recent times is the interconnecting interconnectivity of the supply chain if one point fails then the whole thing fails so if there's not enough people to process meat if there's not enough people to pick fruit and veg if there's not enough people to manufacture product if there's not enough people to then distribute them 
the whole thing is at risk of collapse and it's a range of different factors that have come together at once which is leading to a real problem and you know, i don't think it would be uh, hyperbole to describe it as a crisis there's all sorts of global issues as you say i mean on, I mean, let, let's put the climate emergency to one side. That's obviously ongoing and that needs to be addressed urgently. But you know, raw materials coming in from China, um, there's a shortage of cardboard, there's a shortage of aluminium, you know, there's an armada of ships arriving at port, there's nobody to unload them, so that's creating a load of backlog. Energy prices are soaring, some of our members are seeing their bills go up by as much as 250%. Oil prices are going up. Food inflation is real. It's 1.4% higher in September than it was uh, before the pandemic. Some hospitality businesses are saying that their costs are going up by as much as 18%. So all of these things are coming together and creating genuine problems for the food and drink supply chain. And some of them are immediate issues, some of them more existential structural problems, but all of them need to be addressed. Is this mostly a UK problem? I mean, we we know there's goods being held offshore in numerous countries and ports around the world. But is the labour demand a UK problem? Well, it is a problem in the UK, um, and it's creating a problem for the for businesses operating in the UK. But is it is it worse here, do you think, than others? I, I don't know is the answer to that question. I mean, I'm, that's what some people would like you to believe when they when you say there's a shortage of drivers, they say, oh, there's a shortage of drivers across Europe. That may, may well be the case, but it doesn't doesn't really help the, the problems that we're facing into in the UK. But yeah, I think, you know, Brexit has made a, a, big, a big difference here. The idea that we can bring people into the country via freedom of movement has gone. Uh, temporary visas have been issued, but not to the extent that we really need them to address the issues that we're facing into. And then that's meaning that challenges at borders, both goods both going in and out, and a number of delays in the checks that the government have agreed to as part of the Brexit deal are not happening now. Uh, Northern Ireland is a particular problem, moving goods from GB to NI and we know that the government are trying to renegotiate the deal that they signed only 18 months, two years ago. So, yeah, globally, there are challenges, but unfortunately, we're possibly less fit to be able to deal with them than some of the other uh, countries around the world. So you're going to be very busy then throughout the rest of this year and or into early next year. So and what you've been facing with COVID as well has been it's turning into perpetual crisis, isn't it? It's it's pretty unsustainable to be in crisis mode for so long. So you're looking at at least two years of crises here. How do you cope with that as a leader of an organization? How do you keep your team going in a sustainable manner? And how do you ensure you can still have a voice when, frankly, you're knackered? Yeah, well, it's worse than that. It's not just the last 18 months. So February last year was the first time that we'd heard of this coronavirus thing. And, you know, we can remember the uh, swine flu epidemic of maybe 2010, 11, where it wasn't, you know, people were off, but it wasn't too bad. And probably thinking the similar thing about this coronavirus, oh, yeah, it'll be fine, you know, it'll be a bit of like a flu and we'll be back to normal by the summer. But that was on the back of, uh, a, people forget that we had a, a year of, no deal crisis points. I think there were three or four in 2019 cliff edges where we were looking at no deal, staring down the barrel of no deal, literally days away from saying we're exiting the EU without a deal. And that was the planning for that was immense. Then moving into COVID the you know, last year and beyond, and then the impacts that we've seen uh, when the economy reopened in May with all the labour challenges. So <clears throat> it's two years, really, of staggering from one crisis to another. And as you say, it's not going away. So that will happen again into next year. Um, how do we cope with that? It's really difficult. It's really difficult. You, you are knackered. And it's not just us. We're running a trade association. We've been working from home largely for the last 18 months. But the people that we represent have been working on the front line. They haven't been able to sit in a nice study drinking coffee talking to people on teams. They've been out there working f throughout, um, putting themselves in the front line, not necessarily knowing if they're going to even have a job because the viability of their business was at risk because the hospitality industry shut down. You know, not knowing if they're going to get COVID because they're going into other businesses supplying food and drink, keeping the continuity of uh, public sector food supply going. And all of those people are, if we're tired, you know, they're even more, much, much more exhausted than we'll ever be. So I think we need you need to maintain a bit of perspective, really. 
you know, mentally it's tiring and, you know, intellectually it's a, a challenge to keep talking about these issues and keep being across them and understanding them. But in reality, we're not out there driving. We're not out there in the front line. So, you know, sense of perspective does help. But then that doesn't mean that people obviously don't have challenges and it's not difficult to maintain the same level of service. I think you need to try and find a mechanism to switch off, which is really, really difficult in the early days of COVID. You know, we were working seven days a week for you know, two or three months. And yeah, you know, it comes to a point where you just think, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, but you've got to keep going. Well, what's, what's your method for switching off, James? I think I think having a dividing line between the work that you do and the rest of your life, I mean, it's made much harder by the mobile nature of communications. So I remember when I started work, 1997, working at News International, I went into the office. There was one computer, I think, that had the internet. Uh, if you phoned someone on the landline, they weren't there. You had to leave a message. Went home at five, didn't think about it again until nine the next day. It's not like that anymore. And I think you've got to just try and say, right, I'm going to watch this program, this TV program for an hour without checking my phone. I'm not going to, uh, you know, not going to respond. I'm going to turn it on silent. I'm going to go for a walk without my phone. Actually, I was bitten on the bum a little bit in the early days of uh, COVID because I went. It was I think it would have been the second or third weekend. I'd been you know working relentlessly. I thought, all right, I'm going to go down to Majestic Wine and buy myself some wine for the evening so I can relax. I'm not taking my phone. I've had enough. I'm switching it off. Got home. I'd missed a call from number 10 and uh, Boris Johnson was wanting to do a round table with trade associations, which I, I missed because I was out. So there's a lesson learned there that you can switch off, but only to only to an, a limited extent. Do take your phone with you. I love the fact you turned to a bottle of wine rather than Boris Johnson. That seems a sensible choice for some people, I guess. I, indeed, indeed. Um, so, yeah, no, it is hard. I mean, I, I, I take great pleasure in reading. I love, I love reading books um, and you know, spending time with family and you know, getting some fresh air. I think getting out in the daylight is really important. Often doesn't happen. The clock's going back. It's going to be doubly difficult. But making sure you're getting outside when it's light, I think, is really, really important. Even if it's making calls. But just, just but be outside, I think. Don't, don't be inside all day. It's good advice. Now, from your organisational perspective, how are you setting up, though, to deal with these crises which just keep coming around do you have you changed the way you manage the team uh is there a crisis team at the heart of things or is it we're all on this we're all kicking on yeah we, you know we do we have um relatively smallish teams so everyone is doing all sorts of different things that will necessarily be in you know the strict confines of their job descriptions but we but we've turned the crisis into you know something of a success. We've, our profile has been massively elevated, both within government but also in the media as well. Uh, we're often on TV and radio now talking about issues not necessarily to do with the wholesale distribution, general food and drink industry issues, which is great. And as a result of that, we we're able to expand our team. So we're going to be recruiting some new colleagues next year and broadening our remit a little bit and just offering more of the same, but perhaps being able to do it in a more uh, processed way. It is hard, but that, that's been one of the things that has been actually successful for us. We, we've been able to take a crisis and use it to our advantage. Not, not, not deliberately, it's just happened that way by, by the outputs that we've delivered. But we do need more people to be able to do that. And that's part of our plan for next year will be team expansion. It's always good to hear that people are reflecting on what has happened during a crisis and using those learnings to adapt and change going forward. Uh, what are those key learnings that you would advise our listeners on, uh, James, uh, that you would take away from the last couple of years? I think it's really important to just stick to the process. I know it's not always possible and you do need to sometimes go off piste. But if, if you know what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it and when, makes life a lot easier so you know we are we've obviously had to be opportunistic and think about real-time outputs but always falling back on a process to say right this is how we do this and in this way so we want information from members have a set format for doing that i think that makes life easier it's not always possible and sometimes you do need to go to the sort of real-time responses but ensuring that you understand what you're trying to do 
and and why and also having a sense of perspective as well i think you know it's important to do the best possible job that you can when you're representing people who uh you know we've got seventy thousand people who work for the industries that we represent all of those have got family all of those rely on their businesses being successful and we play a small part in their success but having a sense of perspective as well that ultimately you know it doesn't really matter it's important but you know making sure that you're not getting ideas above your station it's right to do the do the best possible job that you can for the important reasons that uh, you do it um what's next for you i think uh what's next for me is next say next year we're going to be expanding our team we're going to be looking at how we can offer an even better service to our members our profile has been elevated and we want to keep that going we want to continue to be the spokespeople for food and drink and talking about issues you know that, that reflect the reality of the world that we operate in but i think also we want to keep pushing for solutions we've still got issues with labor we've still got issues with product availability we've still got issues of energy costs we've still got issues with issue with products coming in from uh, around the world none of those have been addressed so we've got a, a, a challenge there we've also the government are now opening up the window a little bit to some of the other uh, policies that they haven't had the opportunity to talk about over the last 18 months. Things like um, sustainability, things like HFSS, which is a big challenge for a lot of our members because they'll be supplying into convenience stores whose mix is made up of a lot of HFSS products. Do you want to spell that out, James, for our listeners? What do you mean by that? So high fat, salt and sugar. So, you know, and soft drinks and chocolate bars and crisps and, and cakes, biscuits, all of those types of products that you would see in a convenience store. They will perhaps sell more of those than a supermarket in terms of their overall range. Um, and the number of promotional restrictions that are being placed on those in terms of uh, you know offers that can be made two for ones or where they can be placed uh, in the store or online restrictions around advertising, both on TV, but also on the net as well. And those will have an impact on our customers um, and we need to be able to be positioned to help them through that. But these are the types of policies that are going to be coming forward that haven't been able to. Uh, the government just haven't had the political airtime to be able to focus on them. Sustainability, obviously hugely important. Perhaps the, you know, someone said, I can't remember who now, but it, it was a really, really great point that they made that when the government moved into crisis mode in March 2020, throwing money at the problem of COVID, had they done the same interventions on the climate emergency, would be in a much better position now. And I think, you know, that's where that work will crystallise. I don't think it's going to be done to the extent it needs to be. And that's really a real challenge for all of us. Um, certainly for the members that we represent, we know that we're involved in a lot of sustainability initiatives and we're trying to be carbon neutral um, to the extent that we can be and showcasing that's really important part of what we do. Um, but there's that alongside the challenges of rebuilding the economy post-COVID, all of which is going to come with pain. Um, we're going to see uh, tax going up. We're going to see uh, living wage going up. So business pressures are going to be escalating as well. So we'll be dealing with all of those as alongside looking at the structural challenges and the existential challenges that we've identified during the last year. So it's not going to get any, any easier anytime soon, but having more people on board, I think, will mean that we'll be able to have a bit more time off, which will perhaps be the one thing which will make a bit of a difference. Very good, James. Well, you just you have very much just justified your existence there to your membership, I think, with all those challenges coming up. And we wish you nothing but success. It's important not only for you and your members, but I think for the rest of us as well. Um, thank you so much for talking us through how you're dealing with what is undoubtedly an unprecedented period of crises in such an accomplished manner uh, at FWD. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. The perfect storm that James talked us through is worrying, but I loved what he said about keeping a sense of perspective and focusing on what you should be doing, which is an important message for many of us dealing with issues management on a regular basis. I'm again joined by Karen White of National in Canada and Gary Cleland of Hanover in the UK. Gary, James and I discussed the horse meat scandal, which I'm sure you'll remember. It was a huge issue in the UK, leading the news bulletins for days on end. We chatted through how many B2B suppliers didn't really have a public face at the time because they didn't see it as necessary because they weren't a public facing brand. But it really hurt them uh, when the scandal broke as there was a huge vacuum left. Are B2B business leaders better at this today? As you'd expect, 
there are some business leaders who are better than others, but there remains, I think, a general danger of people in less public facing industries failing to understand how they are or may be perceived by the wider world. A crisis shines a spotlight on your business or your sector, and to be able to communicate effectively when that happens, you need to know where other people are coming from. If you don't, your response may not work. And if you don't respond, then you leave that vacuum for others to fill. The moment of crisis is not the time to be trying to introduce yourself and build reputational capital with media or with your wider stakeholders. So it's a smart approach for all business leaders, no matter the sector, to take the time in those quieter moments, even when it doesn't seem like it should be a priority, to properly hone and articulate your values, your mission, your narrative, and to build those key relationships across media. You'll be thankful you put the time in if and when something does go wrong and when that spotlight is shine on you. Yeah, and I guess there's a lot of particularly big supermarkets who the supply chain are feeding into are now wanting that from the brands that they're working with, even if they are B2B, they're trying to get more out of it, particularly from a sustainability uh, and ESG perspective. Karen, what about you? Yeah, I found that conversation really interesting. Um, We just worked through an issue that quickly grew into concerns about food quality and people questioning the integrity of farmers in our Canadian agriculture sector. Um, And it was an issue that was affecting public confidence in the dairy sector. And because it wasn't clear who was on deck as an industry, what their position was, or who should be speaking to this issue, the narrative quickly got away from them. And in the agriculture sector, they're no stranger to dealing with arising issues um, and the need for having difficult conversations, but they weren't really prepared for this. And so what we did was we established an industry working group with diverse perspectives to kind of ensure that the ag sector and the food sector had the supports and resources in place to manage an issue before it became a crisis. Also to identify who are the credible and key voices that we need on these scenarios that we can anticipate may arise. And so a big part of it was helping them to identify there was an issue to be managed Uh, making sure they were effectively communicating, and then again, identifying who was the most credible voice to deliver that message and helping them to understand they all had a role in ensuring public trust and confidence in the agri-food sector. Well, thank you, Karen. Look, I hope all our listeners have enjoyed our chat with and about James. Uh, His role is a difficult one. Every industry's reputation is impacted by its worst actors, whether they like it or not. So when someone else in your industry screws up, your reputation falls too. It is the reality of reputation management that many fail to understand. It also makes trade organizations like James's incredibly important uh, and at times difficult to run. Uh, So next time you're in a room with your competitors, do have a look around and ask yourself if you are going to let their bad actions impact your reputation. And if you're not, Get on the front foot and be as proactive as possible in filling your reputation gap as soon as possible. By doing so, you will limit the fallout of any of the mistakes your competitors make, as well as your own. Thanks again for listening to White Swan. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, stay safe. White Swan is brought to you by Hanover Communications and its global crisis network. To find out more, please visit hanovercoms.com. That's Hanover, H-A-N-O-V-E-R, comms, C-O-M-M-S dot com.